Now, though, in this week's film programme, Francine Stock marks the re-release of 2001 A Space Odyssey, with a journey into its creation with new interviews, rare archive and listeners' memories. You're listening to BBC 12. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. It took Stanley Kubrick four years to imagine the future. Four years to realise four million years of evolution. Well, good afternoon, gentlemen. How's everything going? (laughs) Marvellous. For those like me who saw 2001 as a child, it remains an experience as magnificent and terrifying as the implacable black monolith of my nightmares waiting in the darkness at the end of the bed. What did it mean, if anything at all? I now know what the film was all about. I think the future. Dave. I saw it in October 1969, and my life was changed. Stop. I bought my ticket and settled into my seat, not entirely sure what to expect. I'd read and heard many things about the movie, not all of them complimentary. Will you stop, Dave? My friend and I smoked a joint. When the first ape appeared, we started giggling, and I remember laughing so hard the whole row of seats was shaking. I'm afraid, Dave. I was nine. I had no idea what it was about. I just knew that something very strange had happened to me in that cinema. Strange and uh, compelling gut-wrenching and physical, like some strange kind of dream. It just went on and on and on. Streaks of pure colour bombarding the screen. Really quite perplexing. My mind is going. By the time we got to the Stargate, it had all worn off, and all we could think about was whether to get another box of Maltesers. I can feel it. I've become totally puzzled. I'm not sure I got it. And even to this day, I feel uncertain about the film. My mind is going. The monolith, the baby and the old man in the end. There is no question about it. We were gobsmacked. It was so intriguing, so thought-provoking. We were all discussing the meaning of it. And uh, the frightening thing that the computer became human. I'm a bad. He became evil. Great. During those three hours, my perception of the world had been changed. 2001, A Space Odyssey? Well, Ape finds the means to subjugate his peers. Technology brings advances, but also greater danger. Man believes he's colonising space, but all along there was something more intelligent out there. Do you read me, Hal? Audiences have been entranced and or exasperated since its release in 1968, and now it's back in cinemas, a gleaming enigma for a whole new generation. Do you read me, Hal? Like every film that Stanley Kubrick made, from Spartacus to Dr. Strangelove to The Shining, 2001 attracts a mythology, that of the fearsomely demanding reclusive director and the ferocious beam of his vision. I had uh, few intellectual interests as a child. I uh, was a school misfit. But here in this rare interview from 1965 with physicist and author Jeremy Bernstein, another Kubrick appears. Thoughtful, charming, human. I became interested in photography. And it was a case of over a period of, say, from the age of 13 to uh, 17, going through step by step by myself without anybody really helping me, the problem solving of being a a photographer. If you can develop a kind of generalized approach to problem solving, it's surprising how it helps you in anything. But the problems would only increase as Kubrick reached for the infinite. His odyssey began at the height of the Cold War, above the space race and down on Earth, youthful revolt. With the backing of MGM Studios, he surrounded himself with young, innovative talents, alongside sages of science and production. His right-hand man was Arthur C. Clarke, who wrote the story The Sentinel, which gives the narrative its form. It was an accident, pure fluke. And fresh from NASA was the illustrator and concept artist Harry Lang. We were racing against the Russians at that time. The budget was $40 billion. We made visuals of Van Braun's and the German scientists' ideas of future space travel, the Apollo, the Saturn missions, even the shuttle, building the space station, but also way beyond, and it's incredibly stimulating. I was in New York delivering artwork. I ran into Arthur Clarke, pure accident, around the corner, January, blizzard and all that. He told me, he said, I'm involved with Stanley Kubrick, and I said, who is he? In praise of Arthur C. Clarke, he is, uh, I think, the most poetic uh, science fiction writer. But he's also nearly the best informed, I think. Right. He is scientifically the best informed, and he has this way of um, writing about mountains and planets and uh, worlds with the same poignancy that people write about uh, children or love affairs. He asked me if I would design the ships, and of course I knew nothing. I didn't know the front and the back of a camera. I knew the diameter of all the planets and the solar system and all that. So I said, well, how long do you want me? And I said, well, as long as it takes. But after six months, uh, I thought it was finished. 
He said, no, you got to come to London now. MGM Studios, Bournemouth, you know, because we're going to have to build it. Open the pod bay doors, please, Hal. Kubrick had originally intended that his space film would have a prologue of distinguished international thinkers musing on the future, but popular culture was fast catching up with missiles, satellites and rockets. The American and Russian space projects were in the news. In the end, Kubrick trusted the power of images and sought an actor to personify the most famous fictional spaceman. I heard a beep. Is that all right? Are we still there? Hello? Dr. Dave Bowman, Kia DeLay. Mission Control, this is X-Ray Delta 1. I was shooting a film directed by Otto Preminger. Preminger was brutal, and he loved to scream at the younger actors. I think he was a sadist. I came home after shooting, and my wife said, call your agent. And he said, are you sitting down? I said, no, why? You've just been offered the lead in Stanley Kubrick's next film. I literally had no idea that I was being considered. From my point of view, it was going from hell to heaven. The film is a series of chapters beginning in darkness before taking us back to mankind's dusty origins, a sequence so difficult to achieve it was shot at the end. <laughs> then Kubrick's first narrative gamble, a wordless drama of early hominids on a vast African plain, or more accurately, a rockscape created at Boreham Wood. Behind them, a luminous, newly devised projection of the desert. The dawn of man, a simulated landscape with tapirs, chimpanzees, a leopard, and a troupe of costume performers in state-of-the-art makeup, led by Alpha Ape, Builder's Moon Watcher, Dan Richter. Stanley and Arthur had been trying to get the opening of 2001 straightened out, and it just really hadn't worked. They had tried things out on a stuntman, they had tried things out on actors, talked about animation, nothing had really gone anywhere. And they had the idea, let's talk to a mime. All I was told was, these are australopithecines, they're uh, early man from three or four million years ago, we want to bring them to life. So I said, give me uh, 20 minutes, uh, stage, uh, leotard and some towels, and I'll show you put a leotard on and I shoved some towels inside it to change the shape of my body a little bit and I came out playing some characters. This uh, tough paranoid guy named Joe that got angry every time Stanley said something and jumped at every noise. Stanley loved it. Lo and behold uh, I was offered a job pretty much on the spot. I had to life cast the whole bodies. I thought well the uh, wardrobe department would then perhaps do the, the fur part of it but then a rather smart wardrobe department boss said to Kubrick, look, this is not wardrobe, this is makeup. Whatever Stu Freeborn does on the head, he should do all over. <laughs> so I thought, oh God, no, I was working seven days a week to perfect. I got to do all the mechanisms I got to work out. Every day I would be up with Stuart. The masks were changed endlessly. Radio control didn't work and you can't run cables up their trouser legs because they're all fighting and running around and everything like that. So I had to tap from the artist's phases, all their little muscles, and find a way of transferring the movement of the artist's muscles and his tongue and his lips to the outside of the foam rubber mask by putting Velcro bits glued to the top of their muscles. <laughs> It was revolting. I mean, the only thing that kept me from vomiting was the realization that if I vomited inside that mask, I'd probably suffocate myself. But the way the jaw and the mask work it really showed the brilliance of Stuart. I mean, first of all, he designed it with little threads so that as the mouth opened, that the lips would roll back a little bit. So I could get a sneer just by dropping my jaw just a little bit. I could slide my tongue inside the tongue. Imagine trying to perform in a costume where the temperature outside is, is approaching 130 Fahrenheit, where you are basically suffocating in slow motion. And at the same time, you know you've got, you know, Stanley stuck this 85 millimeter Nikkor lens on the camera and he's doing a close up on you. And you're trying to get subtle acting values by working your tongue on toggles and, you know, do you understand? You get some idea of the story here. Natural history met Art House with music by a contemporary classical composer, Georges Ligeti. The suggestion of Kubrick's wife, Christiane, who'd heard it on Radio 3. Its combination of voice and instrument was awe-inspiring yet eerie. Ideal for the monolith, that black slab of extraterrestrial intelligence that so agitated the apes. 
great difficulty of that scene, and it's all done in pretty much one take. We have to wake up, start running around. Now, the minute you start running around in those costumes, you start getting tired very fast. And then I had to come up on the monolith and tone down completely. Since we don't have words to express ourselves, I needed as many activities as possible. So you'll see in that scene, for instance, he actually uh, smells it at one point. My other concern, which screwed some of the earlier takes, is that I didn't want to actually touch the monolith because my hands were so dirty and it was matte black and so I was miming touching it and Stanley was saying touch it you have to understand he and I were talking to each other through all these scenes finally I was able to do it in such a way in one of the takes where I rubbed my hand on the side of my thigh so that I would get the dust off it what does it mean apes and audiences ever since have scratched their heads answers to process and even meaning perhaps lie in the boxes of Kubrick's personal archive in the University of the Arts in London's Elephant and Castle. It's hardly Clavius, but the design of the chamber does reflect that of the space terminal. There I found archivist Richard Daniels and the author Piers Bozzoni, specialist in outer space. This is a movie that really depended on thousands and thousands of pieces of paper to log all of the very complicated things they were doing. And yet it was predicting a world almost without paper. The materials coming out of the box here. I've assumed the obligatory white gloves. So what do we have here, Richard? Stills from at least one attempt to film this monolith. And you can see that actually we're outside in the fields of Boreham Wood in the background and you've got a special effects crew. What you have here is a black object which has been stuck onto a sheet of glass trying to get a floating monolith. They wanted their monolith to be as scientifically plausible as it could be, given that who knows what an alien thing would look like. And so Clark and Kubrick exchanged a lot of notes about how would it run itself? Would it be nuclear powered? Would it be whatever? From Clark's point of view, the monolith was so pure black that it soaked up all energy without reflecting anything back. And that's how it would keep itself powered. So they came up with a technical reason why it should be black. But from an artistic point of view, of course, that absence of form, that absence of detail, is one of the things that makes it so compelling. There is no clue about what the monolith is, or why it was constructed, or what its aims are. And that's why the film endures. In the film, the monolith's appearance triggers Moonwatcher's use of the first technology, a bone employed as a weapon. You know, I was supposed to find a bone and crack a skull. That one scene there, I had decided to take it very slow and play with the bone, and you know, this and that, because I knew how it was going to build. After we had shot that, he realized that was the key right there. Cue the most famous time-spanning match cut in film history. He throws the bone up into the blue sky, and a similar shape, a satellite bomb, tumbles gently down through the inky vastness of space, millions of years later. I tend to believe that if you're right, people realize it. <laughs> are, you, are you usually right, Stanley? Well, I, I try to be. <laughs> and then that famous musical juxtaposition. I seem to remember that we tried all sorts of variations of music until that one clicked. Film editor Ray Lovejoy. I think the combination of the images, which were to all intents and purposes set in the 21st century, to music which was 19th century has a particular magic. The two combine very well together. The score that we'd used within the original cutting copy remained the score that we used in the final film. A triumph and a cruel blow to the film's original composer, Alex North, who only discovered when he saw the completed film that his score had been replaced. As brilliant a composer as Alex North was, it's tough, very tough, to compete with Richard Strauss, Johann Strauss and Georges Ligeti. And so into space via a space terminal. I think Arthur Clarke wrote a note to one of his friends. Oh, Stanley's building a 300-foot-long section of the space station. It's not a very important scene. But of course, for Stanley it was, because he was showing that we have this grand achievement, a huge space station, we can routinely travel the moon, and yet we've turned it into something as bland as Stansted or, or Heathrow or any other place like that. It's just another corporate walk through space. So although we've got into space, somehow we are always let down by our own lack of occasion, our own lack of awareness of, of what we're doing. The Stanley always called it a science fact film not a science fiction film. Production designer Harry Lang. I had, of course, brought with me a from NASA seeing a great deal of their equipment. I mean, to stand underneath of a Saturn with all the engines looking down on you, it's an incredible sight. You can duplicate that sort of feel 
and function has a beauty in itself. And on to the moon, created in persuasive detail just months before Neil Armstrong made that first small step. Back in the archive... A student came here one day and he said, oh, did you, did you work from the photographs? I said, what photographs? He said, well, it's the moon. I said, no, I hadn't been there then. Alongside the specialist photography and lighting were meticulously crafted models. Joy Cuff was barely out of art school when she was chosen to collaborate on the moonscape. She now catalogues that work within the Kubrick archive. Every job I had, I've always had a notebook with it. This is 1966. Plaster, underlined it, is the most sympathetic medium for rock terrain. And then I put wet plaster, effects which can be achieved. Splashed with water, either flicked or thrown, that's how we created the craters. Cold tea retards plaster going off. Sometimes you get these lovely cracks which can appear in different forms, like, you know, little tiny cracks on top of great big cracks, because you don't want a mechanical... Kubrick was such a sticker for detail. Normally, I mean, you would not have brush steel walls. You would have silver paper, or the, then you stick a little blue fablon on it, and uh, those are the buttons, because it's in the background, but not on that. That was the real thing, and those buttons were real, and they could light up. It doesn't cost that much more to do it correct, and it does make a visual difference. Air bubbles in the plaster was another very good term. It gave perfect circled craters. We made sure that all the ships, first eggshell white, but then they're dirty down. The space is filthy. The asteroid the dust is just flying all over. It's like coal dust. It's a pretty dirty place. This is where the moon bus landed. So we made the plaster go off slowly, and the dinky toys made all the tracks, and so the guys were driving their dinky toys around, make the tracks. <laughs> See, I had a top secret clearance at NASA, and we were still fiddling with the Russians. So I had to, especially when I was doing the future carrier vehicles, slightly be careful. The detail of the propulsion system, which are altered slightly. Three weeks ago, the American spacecraft Discovery One left on its half billion mile voyage to Jupiter. This marked the first manned attempt to reach this distant planet. Earlier this afternoon, the World Tonight recorded an interview with the crew of Discovery at a distance of 80 million miles from Earth. So, finally, we get to the Odyssey itself and the crew of the Discovery One spaceship. Stanley didn't want us to come across the way scientists had been portrayed in earlier science fiction films. Enter astronaut Dr. Dave Bowman, a man of few words, played by actor Keir Delay, who has rather more. With his colleague Dr. Frank Poole and three other crew in cryogenic hibernation, Bowman's on a mysterious mission to Jupiter. Gary Lockwood, who played the other astronaut and I, had fictional bios. We both had double doctorates. We had a psychological profile in which events that might drive most people around the bend would only upset us a little bit. When you pick up in our story, it's months and months into that voyage. So all the dialogue between the two astronauts has probably been over by that time. We've explored each other's backgrounds. We know each other very well. There isn't a lot of talk. It's just another day. The sixth member of the Discovery crew was not concerned about the problems of hibernation, for he was the latest result in machine intelligence, the HAL 9000 computer. Good afternoon, Hal. How's everything going? Everything is going extremely well. How? Unusual name. Interesting that if you shift the letters one place down the alphabet, you get IBM. But that's coincidence, of course. Everyone knows that. The 9000 series is the most reliable computer ever made. No 9000 computer has ever made a mistake or distorted information. We are all, by any practical definition of the words, foolproof and incapable of error. There's an express note from Stanley Kubrick. We're badly in need of a mad computer expert who can be around and advise on dialogue and jargon to use in computer scenes. As the plotting of the movie progressed, Stanley and Arthur began to exchange notes about what happens during the voyage. Now, there was no clever computer uh, initially. Stanley looked at the series of accidents that they'd come up with to make the astronauts' lives a bit more dramatic mid-flight. And Stanley said, they're accidents. What we need here is a protagonist, some overwhelming cause linking these things together. I think we need to bump up the computer's intelligence. So he fired off a load of memos asking, what's the state of computer intelligence? Are they likely to be uh, as clever as we are? And so on. And I think he satisfied himself 
The answer was yes. But anyway, there came a point late in the production where Stanley was saying, oh, we've now got Hal doing these rather naughty things, murdering half the crew and so on. And so they sent a letter to IBM reassuring them that IBM wouldn't appear in any of the computer consoles near Hal. What's the problem? I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. This mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. It's been said we were more machine-like than the machines, that we had less personality that Hal did. Open the doors. Dave, this conversation can serve no purpose anymore. Goodbye. Hal? Hal? Before we began shooting, uh, Stanley had been thinking about an actor by the name of Martin Balsam, but then he decided very quickly that his accent was too New York. So then he hired a British actor, Nigel Davenport, who was there the first week of shooting with us. Stanley decided it was too British. So then he thought, well, I'll wait into post-production. So then he turned to his first assistant director, Derek Cracknell, you do the voice for the boys. For the rest of the shoot, which was months, this was the voice of Hal. Dive? Oh, no, I can't do that, sorry. I enjoy working with people. I have a stimulating relationship with Dr. Poole and Dr. Bowman. When I first saw the film, two years later, it was brand new, and I thought it was a brilliant choice. He hired Douglas Rain, the Lawrence Olivier of Canada, he probably only worked on the film for three days, but it was perfect. Take a stress pill and think things over. And then betrayal and tragedy for both man and machine, and a showdown in the computer's red memory chamber. I know I've made some very poor decisions recently. Stanley and Arthur C. Clarke were very well aware of the preparations for the Apollo program, where they were trying to fit, by the standards of the 1960s, incredibly complicated computers inside boxes about as large as a car battery. So Stanley's hunch was that even intelligent computers in the 21st century would be quite small boxes. But he changed his mind about this because he thought, right, that's the technical realism, but is it interesting? A box on a table is not interesting, but a box with an astronaut floating around in it in an eerie red light pulling circuits away from the wall, that was interesting. So he did allow himself some artistic license there. Stop. Will you stop, Dave? I'm afraid, Dave. We're now faced with extreme extragalactic jeopardy as astronaut Bowman hurtles into a cosmic corridor through the dimensions of time and space in an ever-accelerating rush of colors, shapes, both organic and synthetic, sometimes beautiful, always weird for the journey through time and space. That was done just with me up on a platform with a camera very close to me with a, a huge light on my face, at times only shooting my eyeball. Stanley was able to do what they used to do in silent films, which is he played music to put me in the mood. And I remember the specific piece that he played was Vaughn Williams' Antarctica Suite. It's the sequence known as Stargate, created by effects wizard Douglas Trumbull with the use of a photographic technique, slit scan. I was just a young kid from L.A. The other production designers on the film were trying to envision a moon of Jupiter that had a slot in it, and we would go through the slot, and on the other side of the slot we'd find another universe. And I had been following the work of one man in Los Angeles who I'd worked with on an earlier project named John Whitney, who was working with some very advanced sort of photographic techniques of keeping the camera shutter open for a long period of time while you moved things around in front of a single frame of film. And it was a revolutionary concept to me that a single frame of film could contain a time exposure of things that occurred over time and create patterns and, and effects on that film. And I thought, well, if you could do it in a two-dimensional way, maybe there's a way to do it in a three-dimensional way. And I worked out a test of moving some patterns relative to the camera and creating this kind of light corridor effect and showed that to Stanley Kubrick and he said, yes, this is the answer to this problem. This will get us into that other dimension. And I said, well, I'll have to build a big machine to do this. This is gonna be quite elaborate. Uh, he said, fine, just do it. Explore new territory, new unknown photographic territory. It was in actual fact a potpourri of thousands of different images, which no question about it, took a long time to find the right pattern and find the right flow. Editor Ray Lovejoy. 
a lot of the images were a lot of helicopter images taken going across the uh, highlands of Scotland, which were then, I think the, the expression was purple-hearted, the negative to all intents and purposes was taken and the colours were changed. Even Stanley would admit there were occasions where, my God, you know, what direction are we going in? Because it was fairly nebulous. It was something that was very, very experimental. For a film that's all about alien influence, there are no direct manifestations of extraterrestrial beings, at least not in Piers Bizzoni. They would look at surrealist paintings and think, well, what if we actually try and make that real rather than surreal? Will that look sufficiently alien? That's got a kind of roiling darkness out of which various forms, including a sort yes. of scarlet millipede type but thing. Look at these ones. Out. These ones here actually show islands hovering in the skies mm. above larger worlds. I mean, it is more intriguing than, for example, this one, which is absolutely your basic flying saucers over what looks like. Um, Reading. Yeah. <laughs> it means a hopeless idea that you could ever produce anything that was unknown to human, because our comprehension of it is in, going to entirely depend on it being relatable to something. So Kubrick was after the impossible. Well, that's right. What, in fact, we glimpse isn't an alien, but a giant baby with a spooky resemblance to Bowman, the star child. It was made by a young sculptor. She got the German taxidermist's eyes and set them into wax inside. There was great big blue eyes. So the whole star child was sitting on a turntable on a darkened stage and just one light source and the camera open with long exposure shots and one little chap with a spray can in case the fly gets too close and starts flying around. That's all he had to do. But uh, he ran out of the stage screaming because it started crying. And what had happened? <laughs> the lights had started melting. <laughs> the wax started running down. He thought he was going mad. Uh, one doesn't get the impression that uh, film directors do think a great deal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, certainly... you, you say that. <laughs> There's a poster. You know. Oh, I mean, yeah. The film took four years to make, but really I think the film came together on the ocean liner as he edited it with a few days to go before the premieres. He threw away so many of the ideas in the editing room. He threw away most of the exposition. He threw away most of the dialogue. He thought, nah, I'm going to go into the deep end here. Throw away as many clues as he could for the audience's benefit, leaving them with a mystery. Perhaps the real insight came to Douglas Trumbull in that cosmic roller coaster, the Stargate sequence. Yeah, I think 2001 was participatory. It really gave a role for the audience in a way and pointed the way to a kind of a cinema that would do that to allow the audience to completely, utterly suspend their disbelief and enter into a movie. Kubrick realized that this was a trip for the audience. 2001 A Space Odyssey, not so much a glimpse of the future of space as of cinema. Mission Control, this is X-Ray Delta One. Transmission concluded. <laughs>